Welcome to lesson 15. In this lesson, we're going to start taking a look at chapter 5 of the course textbook, which again, you can read for free online at inventwithpython.com beyond. Now, code that causes a program to crash is obviously wrong, but crashes aren't the only indicator of possible issues in your programs. You can have bugs that are much more subtle than that, or even just code that's hard to read. Now, just as the smell of gas can indicate a gas leak, or the smell of smoke could indicate a fire, a code smell is a source code pattern that signals potential bugs. A code smell doesn't necessarily mean that there is a problem, but it does mean that you should investigate it. Now, in this and the next few lessons, I'm going to cover several common code smells. What you should remember is that it takes much less time and effort to prevent a bug than to encounter, understand, and then fix a bug later on. Every programmer has stories of spending hours debugging, only to find that the fix involved changing one line of code. Now for this reason, even a whiff of a potential bug should give you pause and prompt you to double check to make sure that you're not creating future problems. Now of course, if you find a code smell in your program, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. Ultimately, whether to address or ignore a code smell is a judgment call for you to make. Now let's go into the first code smell, which is duplicate code. Now duplicate code is any source code that you could have created by copying and pasting some other code in your program. For example, this short program contains duplicate code. It tells you good morning, asks you how you're feeling, lets you enter your feeling, and then says, I'm happy to hear that you're feeling uh, whatever that feeling is that you entered. And then it says, good afternoon, and does the same thing. It asks you for your feeling, and then says, I'm happy to hear that. And then it's finally, it says, good evening, and then repeats this. Now we could have written out this code by copying and pasting these three lines of code over and over again. There is duplicate code in our program, and that's a code smell. Now duplicate code is a problem because it makes changing the code difficult. A change you make to one copy of the duplicate code has to be made to all of the other places as well. For example, if you find some bug in this line of code, you also need to fix that bug here and here. Now the solution to duplicate code is to deduplicate it. That is, you want to make it appear only once in your program. And you can do this by placing the duplicate code inside of a function or a loop. So in this example, I'm going to move the duplicate code into a function. I'll just create a function called ask feeling and copy and paste this code here. And then I'll replace all of these instances of the duplicate code with a call to that function. This code produces the exact same behavior as our previous program, except now if I find a bug in one of these lines of code, I only have to update the code in one place. All of the function calls to this function will automatically have the fixed updated code. Now in another case, I could move the duplicate code into a loop. Let me go back to the original code I had. And let me put this code inside of a loop. Let's see, the different parts are just, it says, good morning, afternoon, or evening. So I can replace this with the time of day variable. And then I can just get rid of this duplicate code. And again, I've deduplicated the code. It only appears once. And so if I want to make any updates or bug fixes, I only have to make it in one place. Let me go back to the original code that I had. And another way that I could deduplicate it is to use both a function and a loop. Let's say I create that ask feeling function again, and this time I have a parameter named time of day. And I replace, oh, 
we go. Place this with time of day. And now I have a function that has a time of day parameter, and I can call this function with various arguments, and this produces the exact same code as our original program that had duplicate code. Now, as with all code smells, avoiding duplicate code isn't a hard and fast rule that you must always follow. In general, the longer the duplicate code section, or the more duplicate copies that appear in your program, the stronger the case for deduplicating it. I don't mind copying and pasting code once or even twice, but, but I generally start considering deduplicating code when three or four copies exist in my program. And sometimes code just isn't worth the trouble of deduplicating. Compare this code example with our original program. Now this has a lot of duplicate code, but it's also really straightforward. One line of code executes after the others. However, here we've introduced some complexity. We have a function that is called, and we have a loop that passes a different parameter, a different argument for the time of day parameter. This is slightly more complicated and takes a little bit more to understand than just the original code. Ultimately, it's up to you to decide which you would rather have in your program. Now, duplicate code is a code smell because it makes your code harder to change consistently. And if you have several duplicates in your program, the solution is to place the code inside of a function or inside of a loop. The next code smell is magic numbers. Now, it's no surprise that programming involves numbers, but some of the numbers that appear in your source code can confuse other programmers or even yourself in the future. Uh, for example, what if I had code that looked like this? Expiration equals time dot time plus 604800. Now the time dot time function, that returns an integer representing the current time. Um, we can ex as, and we can assume that the expiration variable represents some point 604,800 seconds into the future. But this is a rather mysterious number. What's the significance of this number? Now, a comment can help clarify this. We could say expire in one week. And this is a good solution. It helps explain what this number represents, the number of seconds in one week. But a better solution is to replace this magic number, as it's called, with a constant. Now, constants are variables whose names are written in uppercase letters to indicate that their, val that their values shouldn't change after their initial assignment. Uh, usually we define these as global variables at the top of a source code file. Uh, for example, let me set up constants for different time amounts. And I could have a constant called seconds per minute. And seconds per hour. And now that we have this constant, we could replace this magic number with a constant instead. And we could also use these other constants elsewhere in our program if we need them. Now magic numbers are bad because you could have the same magic number being used in two different ways. For example, I could create some constants called uh, the number of cards in a deck of cards, that's 52. But then I could also have a com uh, constant that's for the number of weeks in a year, which is also 52. Now using these constants allows us to avoid having a duplicate magic number. This makes a lot more sense if we have code that says this deck contains and then this constant. Or the two-year contract lasts for two times the number of weeks in year, uh, that number of weeks. This is much better than having code that looks like this, where even though these are the same values, 
they have different meanings. By using constants, we can capture those two different meanings. And it's especially important because in future versions of this program, we might change these constants. For example, what if we include a joker in this deck? Then the number of cards in the deck would be 53. If we were just using 52 and not using these constants, we might accidentally do something like do a find and replace where we update 52 with 53, but then end up changing code that we didn't mean to change. Uh, using constants and avoiding magic numbers is a way that we can prevent this kind of bug from happening. And finally, commented out code and dead code is another code smell. So oftentimes we'll comment out some code so that it doesn't run, and that's fine as a temporary measure. You can see right here I've commented out this function call to a do another thing function. Now you might do this because you want to skip some lines to test some other functionality, or so you'd want to comment this out so that you can easily add it back in later on. But if you leave the commented out code in your program for a while, it can later become sort of a mystery as to why this was removed and under what condition it might be needed again. So if I opened a source code file and I found code that looked like this, I'd immediately have a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, what was do another thing doing? Uh, why did we comment it out? Are we ever going to include it again? Uh, why wasn't this second call to do another thing commented out as well? And is there a reason that I shouldn't just outright delete this code since it doesn't run anyway? If you leave commented out code in your source code and for the long term, these are questions that future people who are looking at this code might have. Another code smell is dead code. And this is code that can logically never run. It's unreachable code. For example, I'm going to import random and I'll create a coin flip function. And we'll just say if random rand int 0, 1. Uh, if that's false, we'll return heads. Else. Oh, whoops. Else will return tails. And then after that, we'll have return uh, the coin landed on its edge. Now, this function is syntactically valid. You can call it no problem. I can call coin flip and print the return value, and it prints out heads. However, this line is kind of mysterious because it can never be run. Uh, this condition will either be true, in which case the function returns here, or else, if it's false, it will return here. There is no circumstance where this code ever runs. Now, dead code like this can be misleading because programmers reading it will assume that it's an active part of the program when effectively it's the same as commented out code that never runs. If you're not reading this code carefully, you might assume that the coin landed on its edge is a string that could be returned from the coin flip function sometimes when actually it's logically impossible for this code to ever run. Now there is an exception to dead code as a code smell, and that's when you have a stub. So for example, I'm writing an example function right here, and right now I just have the keyword pass here. So a pass statement in Python does absolutely nothing. It only exists so that we can have some indented code right here. Now this is called a stub function, and it does nothing. But the reason we have it is because this is a placeholder for some future functionality that we'll add later. So having dead code like this is fine. We're just putting this down and this pass statement here to indicate that eventually we're going to complete this function later on. Now alternatively, to avoid accidentally calling a stub function and then having it do nothing when you expected it to do something, you could have this raise the not implemented error. Now raising a not implemented error will warn you whenever your program calls a stub function or method by accident. So when I run this program, 
you can see it raises the not implemented error. Whereas when this was just a pass statement, it does nothing, and we might have assumed that the example function did something when it in fact we haven't, uh, it does nothing because we haven't implemented it yet. So commented out code and dead code are code smells because they can mislead programmers into thinking that the code is an executable part of their program when really it's not doing anything. Now in the next lesson, we'll continue taking a look at some more code smells, including print debugging and also classes that should just be functions or modules.